Wow, we have a lot of big changes going on at the Stumpy Nubs Workshop. This is the first episode of a new podcast, similar to our old podcast, but with a different look and feel. Now, before some of you get all freaked out, this isn't replacing the cool homemade tool videos and other things that we do. It's actually our way of taking some of the chit-chat out of those videos. I'm going to let the stash here explain it. Way back in 2000 something or other, when Stumpy first started to show, it was presented in a segmental format. There was a central project, usually a homemade tool or jig, and various other segments mixed in. A woodworking tip, a tool review, an email segment, a commentary. Sometimes we even showed off a project and interviewed other woodworkers. The problem is, to get to the point crowd, wanted to see the project without all the other stuff in it. And I'm afraid that we let them win. Lately, we've been producing a lot shorter videos without any of the other segments that some people originally subscribed to see. And I also miss the variety that was in those first couple of years. So this is my solution. We're going to begin the new year with a new podcast. It's called Behind the Sawdust because it's intended to keep you up to date on what's going on in the woodworking world. We'll have a series of segments discussing tools, new blogs and articles from the leaders in the craft, tips, tricks, and more, all designed to be both entertaining and informative. We're not going to cover many of the YouTube woodworkers because the Drunken Woodworker podcast is already doing a great job at that, so we're going to stay off his turf. We're really just going to do a lot of what we used to do, but with a whole new look and feel to it. And we're still going to be making our homemade tool and jig videos and more of the old-timey workshop, so don't worry about that. But this is a way to get back to our roots and to produce weekly content again. So sit back and enjoy the first edition of Behind the Sawdust. I'm Stumpy Nubs, this is Mustache Mike, and welcome to Behind the Sawdust. In the next few minutes, we'll get you up to date on what's going on in the woodworking world. I'm going to go into a rant about the Woodwright Shop. We'll show you our favorite projects of the week, give you a couple of shop tips, introduce you to a new tool, and show you how to make a handy rotor jig. Oh, and we're also going to give away a few hundred dollars worth of tools. Now, before we get started, I have to show you something. These are some hand-turned wood travel mugs that the folks over at Clearview Cyclone sent over to us. They even uh, used CNC to put our name and their logo in it. We just want to take an opportunity to say thanks to Jim and the other guys over at Clearview Cyclones. Thanks, Jim. So now, let's get on with the woodworking news. One of the biggest stories this week has to be the release of the first issue of 360 Woodworking, the online e-magazine. If you've never heard of 360 Woodworking, it's what happens when you tick off three of the finest woodworkers in the craft. Glenn Huey, Chuck Bender, and Robert Lang recently told Popular Woodworking Magazine where to stick it and walked away with not only their unique talents, but also their sizable following, at least part of it, which became the subscriber base for a new online magazine. So what did you think about the premiere issue? I gotta say, I thought it was good. You know, obviously it's a digital edition, so is it still going to have, a, we might say, the look and feel of a, a professional magazine that you kind of can get your hands on? I think it really did. The articles, the projects, they were well laid out, lots of good photos, and that, of course, is always important. was one thing that I thought was just a little bit confusing. I thought it was going to be a PDF magazine that was going to come out every other month, but I've already started to notice the first article is already in the next issue online. Yeah, I was a little confused about that too, so I sent Robert Lang an email and asked him about it, and he explained it to me. He said that there's actually two parts to their website. There's the free side, which is going to have blogs and um, articles for, you know, I, I think they're going to cover quite a range of stuff with that, but there's also the paid side, and that's where the magazine comes in. It's going to have an issue every other month, but they're going to release it one article mm, at a time, yeah. 
per one article per week. So every week you get a new article on the last week, that would be the eighth week, you'd get a couple of project articles, and then they call that an issue. So to me, it's more of a blog than a digital magazine. I would have you know, preferred to see it released altogether in a PDF form, but that's just my personal opinion. And um, you know, once we wait and see how it's going to work out over the next several months, I'll probably change my mind anyway. In his online blog, Chris Schwartz recently told the story of his first meeting with woodworking legend Frank Klaus. It seems about 15 years ago, Chris was at a woodworking show demonstrating some homemade infill planes when Klaus walked up to his bench, looked at his planes, and then walked away with one of them, leaving Chris standing there in front of his audience. After disassembling it and cleaning it all up, Klaus returned to lecture Chris in front of his audience about the importance of keeping rust off your tools. You can read the whole story at the Chris, Chris Schwartz blog, but the moral appears to me to be that if an elderly man steals your tools, don't chase him down for a savage beating. He may just want to teach you a valuable and embarrassing lesson. On January the 18th through the 25th, Fine Woodworking and Colonial Williamsburg will be presenting the 17th annual 18th Century Woodworking Conference. This year's theme is desk, the right stuff, and we'll explore the design, construction, and evolution of desks through the 1700s. Not only will they display a number of examples, but they will also be building three 18th century desks from start to finish in the historic Anthony Hay Cabinet Shop. The registration fee is $350 per person, and it starts the day after tomorrow. So. If this is the first that you've heard of it, you're probably not going, and this story wasn't all that helpful, was it? The latest issue of Wood Magazine is on the newsstands, and inside they have their 2008 Innovate Awards. Seems that none of my homemade tools made the list, but, you know, whatever. By far one of the coolest things on this list was the Doolin Table Saw Fence. It attaches to your current fence, but it has a built-in auto feed. You turn the crank on the end to power the drive roller, which feeds the stock into the blade. At least that's what the article says. But if you go to their website, things are a little bit different. First off, there's a big notice that says the $250 price quoted in the Wood Magazine article has been adjusted to the bargain basement price of $325 for the three-foot model. Come on, let's be fair. It is a pretty good idea. I just have a couple of questions about it. Like, for example, if you go to the website and you look at the video, I believe that's the maker of the jig who's doing the video, and even he seems to struggle with keeping a consistent feed rate. He's got it on his jointer fence, actually, and he's turning that crank to feed the wood across and just keeping it, you know, there's some pauses sometimes, and with hardwood, you're going to get scorching or an uneven surface if you do that. Okay, well, let's be fair. Really, the video isn't the same as what's in the magazine. Instead of a feed roller, what you're shown is a little finger that pushes the end of the workpiece. And you got to admit, it's going to affect the size of the material that you can use on it. Okay, I did notice that too. So uh, we've got a few questions, but I think it's new to the market, so... It's going to be a while before people start getting it in their workshops, and we'll see if it's actually a good tool. I'm looking forward to learning more about it. There's some other great new innovations in that issue of Wood Magazine, so check it out if you get a chance. Could you autograph my personal copy? Aw, uh, seriously? No, not seriously. If you've got the new issue of Wood Magazine, you know that I wrote an article about the homemade woodworking tool movement. I show off some of my creations, tell you why you should make your own tools, and I also credit some of the jig makers who inspire me. You know who you are. Izzy, John, Matthias. In other more interesting woodworking news, Popular Woodworking has announced the release of a limited supply of the Woodwright Shops DVD, seasons 21 through 31, for about 60% off the individual price. If you're a fan of the classic PBS show and you don't mind missing a few meals to save up the cash, this is the cheapest way to fill your collection. At around 180 bucks, it's a little pricey for me, but I'm fortunate enough to have a boss who keeps the entire set playing on a loop in the shop bathroom. But even though 
he saved money as usually Stumpy tries to, something to complain about always happens. And that's the subject of this week's advice column. I'm on to you, popular woodworking. You might write a good woodworking magazine. You may even be publishing my book this fall. Check it out at a store near you. But this wood right shop thing is the biggest scam I've seen since those stinking Girl Scouts and their cookies. It's not that the entire DVD set of the free PBS show costs near $1,000. I get it. Roy's life work is extremely valuable and somebody got to get paid. But it's these sales that tick me off. I can go to your website any day of the week, and lo and behold, single seasons of the Woodwright Shop are 25% off. Turns out, they seem to be pretty much always 25% off. They say retail $40, but let's be serious. They're always selling for $30. Who's retailing them at $40 then? As far as I know, you're the only one selling them. It's like when I go to the outlet mall to buy pants, and they have that big sign that says, Today only, $29.99. Compare it, $700. Nobody sells my favorite slim cut stonewash 80s jeans for seven grand. They're $29.99 everywhere, every day. These made up perpetual sales drive me nuts. Whether it's a store that marks up their prices just so they can pretend to mark them down, or in this case, it's a sale that is always going on, so it's not really a sale. We don't need the hype. We love Roy Underhill. If it's 30 bucks a season, it's 30 bucks a season. If it's 40, it's 40. Don't pretend the price is discounted. It's always the same price every single day. But you gotta admit, this 11 season package is still a pretty good deal. Yes, I admit it's a good deal. In fact, as they've been coming out with a decade at a time, I've been buying them. But, oh, that's another thing. Popular Woodworking Magazine. Why can't your PayPal checkout ever work? I swear, if I have to come Thank down- you. Bryce Aristed from Help Desk Furniture was recently featured in Woodworker's Journal. Bryce helps Ugandans who have more talent than tools make furniture from sustainable African hardwoods for sale to customers in the U.S. Not only does this give them a rare market for high quality furniture that they don't have in Uganda, but part of the profits also help support Ugandan schools. I thought it was interesting how that they use a lot of hand tools there. Not because they want to use hand tools, but because they're just so common. Uh, Stanley just made so many hand planes and stuff that they're all over the place, even in Uganda. Yeah, I just like that part too, where the first time they saw the table saw a tapering jig, you know, they couldn't understand why is that going to be any better than doing it by hand. But then they saw how much faster it was going to work. So there's always something to be said for hand tool use, but if you got to make a living out of cranking out a lot of precise peaches, Power and RPMs yeah. are going to make a big factor. Now you can learn about Bryce's work in Uganda in the February issue of Woodworker's Journal. Robert Lang recently visited the famous Roycroft Inn, home to some of the most beautiful woodwork of the Craftsman era. The purpose of his visit was not just to see the designs close up, but to experience the furniture in its natural setting. It's one thing to see a classic piece, but to see it in the environment it was intended to occupy can reveal a lot more about why it was designed the way it was. The 1900s Inn is open to the public. You can enjoy a meal or even spend the night among the original pieces by Stickley and other turn of the century masters. But if a trip is not in your near future, I highly recommend downloading the free PDF presentation that Robert Lang created, which includes an article and a series of wonderful photographs. you find the link below in the show notes. We all love to see our fellow woodworkers woodworking. So, in each episode, we will be featuring some projects that caught our attention over the past week. For now, we're selecting them from Lumberjocks.com. But in the future, we hope to show viewer projects that you email in, and maybe we'll even offer some prizes. First up is a beautiful chair by Woodbridge. This is a reproduction of Charles Rolfe's 1898 desk chair. And while I prefer a little more stuffing in my seat, its beauty is undeniable. He made it from African mahogany, and it actually appears in the next issue of Popular Woodworking. E.B. Lansfield built this rocking Harley out of sepalay and maple using some plans he bought online. 
It looks like a lot of work, but his grandson will enjoy many years rocking this hog. Red Oak 49's workbench cell phone holder is exactly the kind of thing I like to see. He had a problem, and he solved it in a cool way. Plus, it can be used with a tablet to watch Stumpy Nubs videos while he works. Scott of Lazy River Studio hand carved this sofa table for a customer. It's made of cedar and would drive my squirrel-hating dog absolutely nuts. Get it? Squirrel? Nuts? Nice job anyway, Scott. Finally, we have my kind of chair. I love to see people incorporate function into their designs, and that's exactly what Brian A. Rice did. The cushions are leather, and there's even a built-in LED book light. If you got a project that you want to show off, send some photos and a description to support at StumpyNubs.com. Maybe your work will inspire someone else. Jet Tools is giving away a workshop. One person will receive a new hybrid table saw, a professional quality bandsaw, a mini wood lathe, and an ambient air filtration system. The total value is said to be $4,000, and a winner will be selected from all entries after January 31st. You can learn more at the link below in the show notes. Your chances of winning are a lot lower than your chances of getting a bunch of unsolicited advertisements, so you may want to enter that special email address that you use for this sort of thing. Last week, Paul Sellers wrote a blog that's worth reading if you're into old hand tools. It's entitled, eBay Gives Us More Than Cheap Goods. As I read the article, I wasn't sure what he meant. He starts out with longing for those old days of searching basements and cellars for somebody's granddad's tool chest. He appears to say that eBay ruined the adventure by bringing the treasures out of their hiding places and flooding the market. But by the article's end, you see that he's had a change of heart and why he says eBay has greatly rewarded him. I love eBay, especially for old tools, but I can see his point. You know, if I'm at a flea market or a yard sale and I see something that I want, it's really exciting, especially if it's something I've been looking for for a long time. But now tools that used to be considered rare are more common because they're all on eBay now. It kind of takes the adventure out of the whole thing. Yeah, right, until you get the box in the mail. <laughs> yeah. You can put just about anything in a box, and I'll wet myself with excitement over that. You can check out that article at paulsellers.com or at the link below. It's time for some woodworking tips. My tip this week is on blade setup for half-lap joints. Whether you're using a dado set or just a regular cross-cut blade, you have to set the height exactly half the thickness of your material. The easiest way is to use a scrap piece of the stock you're working with. You raise the blade just a bit less than what looks to be the center of the workpiece. Then make a test cut on both sides. Repeat the process, raising the blade a tiny bit at a time until you cut away the last little bit of that material and you've got the perfect setup. My tip of the week takes Stumpy's idea even farther. Miter joints aren't particularly strong because you're gluing end grain to end grain. So the next time that you make a mitered frame, you may try a mitered half lap. These provide a long grain gluing surface and are a much stronger way to get the same look. Our tool of the week comes from Tormek, and it's actually something new on the market. It's a micro adjustable tool rest for using all those great Tormek jigs on your bench grinder. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you how you can win one of these and how you can win one of Tormek's new T4 wet sharpening systems. But first, Mustache Mike got to spend some time with one of these babies, and he's going to judge it based on three criteria, performance, quality, and overall value. So let's start with performance. How did it work? Simply put, I thought it worked really well. Um, it mounts to the bench top in front of your grinder, which means, of course, your grinder's got to be mounted down as well. You know what? I think personally, and as we kind of tested it here in the workshop, I like the way we set it up, where both are attached to the piece of plywood. It gives you flexibility if you want to take it off and put it down under the bench. As we worked with it, I found that using one of the Tormat jigs with this type of toolbar made it a lot easier to move the tool on and off from the stone. It helps you to keep from overheating and it keeps that precise angle and of course, probably the best feature of it is the 
a micro adjuster. I didn't really see any problems with it whatsoever. So as far as performance, five mustaches out of five. Okay, well, what about quality? How well was it made? Really nice. And, you know, obviously it's going to be pretty hard to mess something like this up. It's got just a couple moving parts, and all the moving parts are, you know, made out of metal. Uh, the guide itself is nickel-plated, so it's not going to rust. Um, the mount is zinc, so really, as far as that goes, a uh, five out of five when it comes to quality. Okay, well, what about final overall value? Was it worth the price? Well, like I said, it did what it was supposed to do, and obviously it's going to last a long time, so that makes it in itself a good value. Initially, the $70 did seem a little pricey to me. Um, it doesn't come with any sharpening jigs, which I guess is understandable, but I feel it would have been nice to have had one of those plastic angle gauges at least. You know, obviously they're going to suppose that you've already got mm. the Tormac wet sharpener, so you're going to have those jigs. So I guess that doesn't make it a big deal. So on the mustachio meter, four out of five. Well, there you have it, folks. The new Tormac grinder tool rest gets four and two thirds out of five mustaches on the old mustachio meter. So that makes it a pretty good buy. Time to give away some stuff. We've made a deal with Affinity Tool Works, which is a woodworking tool supplier based here in Michigan, to give away three of the tool rests and one brand new T4 Tormac wet sharpening system. We're giving one prize a week away for the next four weeks. And to be eligible, you have to do a few things. So get out a pen and paper. All this stuff is free. Number one, if you haven't already, and I don't know why you wouldn't have, you need to be a subscriber to our YouTube channel. Number two, if you're not already, you need to add the Stumpy Nubs Twitter feed to your follow list. And then number three, you have to add the Affinity Tools Twitter feed to your follow list on Twitter. And then you need to tweet out this. So if you don't know what Twitter is, get your kids to help you. It's worth the effort to get these sweet tools. And we're going to be giving away lots of other stuff down the road. And you're going to have to be following this to be eligible. And once you sign up, you're going to be eligible for all of it. So you may as well just get it done right now. On the next three shows, we'll be giving away tool rests. And in four weeks, we'll give away the Tormac system. Now don't forget, you have to be a subscriber to our YouTube channel and a follower of both the Stumpy Nubs and the Affinity Toolworks Twitter feeds, and then you have to tweet that line out. Now, before we wrap things up, Mustache Mike is going to show you his free woodworking jig of the week. When you're working with a router, it can be a real pain setting it down with a bit exposed. You can try to lay it on its side, but I prefer to use a simple jig. It's just a platform made with some scraps of wood. You make the top a little bit larger than the base of the router. You drill about a one inch hole in the center and you attach some legs. It may be simple, but it's really handy. How cool is that? Well, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out StumpyNubs.com for our new upcoming tool builds. And until next time, sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend.